We may complain about it when we're out of Factor 50 cream, but let's face it, we'll miss it when it's gone. Of course, talking about our nearest star, the good old sun, only 4.6 billion years young and doing a hell of a job. That's why it will be bad news when in about 5 billion years it will enter the phase leading to star death. Okay, so definitely something we don't have to worry about today, but it is still fascinating to consider what will happen when our sun dies out. Low to intermediate mass stars such as the sun are destined to become white Dwarfs. White dwarfs are rather common celestial bodies in the sense that there are at least a million of them in the Milky Way galaxy alone, but their characteristics are far from common. These objects exert an enormous gravitational pull, which can steal matter from other stars, trigger thermonuclear reactions, and even rip apart entire planets, so they're pretty terrifying. But these harbingers of destruction may possess another set of unique features, which may hold the key to identifying signs of extra terrestrial life. White dwarf stars are the evolutionary endpoint of stars with low to intermediate mass. As defined by the European Space Agency, a white dwarf is the stellar core left behind after a dying star has exhausted its nuclear fuel. So picture a very, very distant future in which our sun will exhaust its fuel, i.e. hydrogen being converted into helium. Helium will then convert into carbon and carbon will start to contract. At the same time, the star will shed its outer layers, which will form a planetary nebula. The newly formed carbon core will not reach a high enough temperature to ignite, thus putting an end to all fusion processes in the star's core. The carbon atoms will continue contracting until all of the electrons will be squeezed into the smallest possible space. Once the core has stopped contracting, the white dwarf will have cooled down to a relatively low 100,000 Kelvin. For comparison, the sun's core has a temperature of 15 million Kelvin. But on the outside, a white dwarf is much cooler. At the beginning of its cycle, a white dwarf will register a surface temperature of 5,810 Kelvin. This may cool down to 3,977 Kelvin after a span of 8 billion years. The dying dwarf will continue to emit residual heat and radiation. Due to the lack of an internal energy source, this will result in a continuous cooling down of the dying star. After hundreds of billions of years, the white dwarf will stop emitting heat, radiation, and light. It will no longer be visible, becoming a black dwarf. Now, considering that the age of the universe is estimated at 13.7 billion years, black dwarfs are a theoretical concept and have never been observed. However, the amount of light emitted by a white dwarf can provide useful information about its age. Even further, luminosity of white dwarfs can be used to measure how long ago stars formed in a particular region of the cosmos. Besides their age, astronomers are able to measure other interesting variables of these dying stars, such as size, density, and gravitational pull. According to our favorite purveyor of astronomical facts, Swinburne University, white dwarfs typically are roughly the same size as the Earth, but they are immensely denser. Our planet has a density of 5,515 kilograms per cubic meter. A white dwarf's density is measured at 1 billion kilos per cubic meter, making it 200,000 times as dense as Earth. White dwarfs are therefore one of the densest collections of matter, second only to neutron stars. Another way to put this is that white dwarfs have the same mass as the sun squeezed into an Earth-sized object. Curiously, the more mass they have, the smaller they are in size. If a white dwarf surpasses the so-called Chandrasekhar limit, equivalent to 1.4 the mass of the sun, the dying star will collapse further into an even denser object, such as a neutron star or a black hole. One of the consequences of such incredible density and high mass is that white dwarfs exert a staggering gravitational pull. The force of gravity on a white dwarf's surface can be over a hundred thousand times what we experience on Earth. And this gravitational pull is at the root of another typical feature of white dwarfs, the nova outbursts. White dwarfs often coexist with a companion star who is yet to enter its dying phase. In this case, the white dwarf is referred to as the primary star, while the normal non-dying and still perky companion is the secondary star. Due to the intense gravity that we described earlier, the companion star loses hydrogen-rich material, which is then pulled into the primary star, a process known as accretion. In other words, the dying white dwarf steals energy from the secondary companion, still in its prime. These binary star systems are known as cataclysmic variables. CVs are typically small, usually the size of the Earth-Moon system, and are also very numerous, with more than one million in our galaxy. The secondary star revolves around a primary one, boasting an impressive 
impressively fast orbital period of some 10 hours, with the fastest one being recorded at 51 minutes. But now let's get to the novae. The term comes from the Latin nova stellar, or new star. It was coined by early astronomers to describe when they observed the birth of, well, a new star, or so they thought. But what can be perceived as being a new star bursting into existence is actually an outburst, a massive thermonuclear reaction taking place within a cataclysmic variable. And this reaction takes place when enough hydrogen-rich material is sucked into the white dwarf from its companion star. More precisely, the stolen hydrogen and helium will form a layer on the surface of the white dwarf. As these elements keep accreting, the temperature at the bottom of this layer may increase up to 10 million Kelvin, which will be enough to trigger nuclear fusion. Hydrogen will then convert into heavier elements as a result of all that heat and pressure. This process will release enormous amounts of energy, which will dial up the temperature and in turn burn hydrogen at an extremely high rate. This takes us to the final step. The energy released violently ejects most of this remaining unburned hydrogen from the surface of the white dwarf. The ejected material takes the form of a shell, moving at speeds of 1500 kilometers per second. This violent ejection of energy and hydrogen is perceived from the Earth as a sudden burst of light, lasting days or even years, increasing the luminosity of the cataclysmic variable by up to 19 magnitudes. And that's what we call a nova. If a CV has been observed to erupt just once, that's a classical nova, but CVs have a knack for bursting out more than once, even if it may take them up to 100,000 years before they perform an encore of their fireworks display. Some are known to be more generous with their audience lighting up the sky every 10 to 100 years, and those are known as recurrent novae. There is a third type of novae known as a dwarf novae. These are eruptions in which the brightness of the CV increases by only up to five magnitudes, and outbursts do not last longer than 20 days. These may originate from a different mechanism compared to the regular novae known as a mass transfer burst model. This is basically what it says on the tin, a sudden massive increase in the transfer of hydrogen from the companion star to the white dwarf will cause an unpredictable yet smaller outburst. All occurrences of novae will result in the ejection of matter from the CV and the white dwarf in particular, but not all matter. As some of it is retained, the white dwarf primary will continue to leach matter from its secondary companion, thus increasing its mass over time. As the white dwarf's mass increases, it will inch towards the Chandrasekhar limit, 1.4 times the mass of the sun, and as the white dwarf approaches that limit, carbon inside its core will undergo a process of instant fusion, resulting in a white dwarf supernova, also known as a type 1a supernova. This is a truly cataclysmic explosion, which results in the destruction of the white dwarf. The immense pull exerted by white dwarfs can generate another type of cataclysmic consequence. Their gravity can literally shred and rip apart other celestial bodies who are unlucky enough to be caught in their orbit. In May 2013, the European Space Agency, or ESA, reported how the Hubble telescope had identified traces of silicon floating about in the atmosphere of two white dwarfs located some 150 light years from Earth. According to Professor J. Farihi, back then with Cambridge University, the quote, silicon may have come from asteroids that were shredded by the white dwarf's gravity when they veered too close to the stars. ESA further explains that the asteroids, measuring some 160 kilometers across, were gravitational torn apart by the white dwarf's strong tidal forces before eventually falling onto the dead stars. If you allow us a fly to fancy here, we may describe this event as a white dwarf holding captive a pair of innocent asteroids, tearing them apart limb from limb and finally consuming them into its core. But the white dwarfs may be capable of shredding even larger prey than humble flying space rocks. In April 2015, researchers at NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory found evidence that a white dwarf, quote, may have ripped apart a planet as it came too close. This means that for close encounters, the gravitational pull of the star and the associated tides caused by the difference in gravity's pull on the near and far side of the planet are greatly enhanced. For example, the gravity at the surface of a white dwarf is over 10,000 times higher than the gravity at the surface of the sun. Researchers used the ESA's International Gamma Ray Astrophysics Laboratory, or INTEGRAL, to discover a new source of X-ray emissions located at the center of NGC 6388. This is a globular cluster, or conglomeration of stars bound by gravity. Researchers initially believed that the X-rays were emitted by a black hole, which they theorized was at the center of NGC 6388. On closer inspection, they realized that the source 
were slightly off from the center. Enter another NASA X-ray telescope, which monitored the emissions for a period of 200 days. Over that span, researchers found that the intensity of the X-rays dropped at a rate comparable with, quote, theoretical models of a disruption of a planet by the gravitational tidal forces of a white dwarf. According to such models, a planet starts by chilling around its parent star, orbiting as planets are wont to do. Then, a globular cluster pulls it away thanks to the massive gravity it exerts. Once the planet enters the cluster, it may pass too close to a white dwarf. And that's when the real trouble begins, as the planet, quote, can be torn apart by the intense tidal forces of the white dwarf. The planet might initially break into large sections, which then collide with each other, further fragmenting into smaller shreds of debris. These bite-sized shards make for a perfect snack for the white dwarf. Attracted by its gravity, the debris plunges towards the dead star's core, igniting and glowing on its way down. It's during this latter phase that the remnants of the planet emit X-rays according to a very specific pattern, which can then be picked up by the likes of ESA's Integral. Based on the data collected, Chandra researchers estimated that the planet ripped apart within NGC 6388 was not a small catch, far from it. It may have contained about one-third the mass of Earth. For reference, Mars contains about a tenth of Earth's mass. And if you allow us another flight of fancy, at this stage, we might represent white dwarfs as some sort of undead monster, who either sucks matter and energy from an enslaved star or rips apart and devours a planet. But let's not be so hard on white dwarfs, as these objects may hold the key to identifying the presence of life on planets outside the solar system. Let's introduce Professor Lisa Kaltenegger, Dr. Thea Kazakis, and researcher Xiphon Lin at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. In January 2020, they published a paper titled High Resolution Spectra and Biosignatures of Earth-like Planets Transiting White Dwarfs. This identified white dwarfs as an area of interest in the search for habitable exoplanets and life away from Earth. What makes them intriguing is their size, only slightly larger than the Earth. It's therefore easier to spot Earth-like planets when they orbit a white dwarf as compared to when they orbit a sun-sized star. As explained by Dr. Kazakis, the search for exoplanets is normally based on the transit method, by which, quote, we wait for the planet to go in front of its star, and the planet is detected when it blocks a fraction of the star's light. But it is actually easier to detect planets around smaller stars as more of the host star's light is blocked. In their research, the team used spectral models, i.e. models describing the evolution over time of light emitted by a white dwarf. In this case, their model simulated the evolution of a white dwarf with a mass about 0.6 that of the Sun and an atmosphere of pure hydrogen. Even more precisely, the Cornell team focused on a specific phase occurring 8 billion years after a white dwarf is formed. That's when the surface temperature of the dead star cools down to 3,977 degrees Kelvin. According to their paper, in this temperature range, a white dwarf could support a stable Goldilocks zone. That is, a star's orbital range where a planet could be blessed with liquid water on its surface and thus potentially sustain life. This is not to say that an exoplanet orbiting a white dwarf would be a dead ringer for Earth. According to Professor Kaltenegger, the difference in the nature and amount of light transmitted by the stars changes the photochemistry and thus the chemical composition of the planets. Therefore, the chemical properties of planets orbiting a white dwarf will be different from those orbiting a sun-like star. Nonetheless, the Cornell researchers created a model showing different ratios of chemical on a hypothetical Earth-like planet orbiting a white dwarf as it cools down. They focused in particular on the presence and ratio of elements and molecules such as oxygen, ozone, methane, and nitrous oxide. According to Dr. Kazakis, these are, quote, chemical features of an atmosphere which could indicate life. The end result of the Cornell team's work was to use their models to develop a series of publicly available high-resolution transmission spectra. To clarify, transmission spectroscopy is a technique used to study the atmosphere of exoplanets which analyze the changes in light spectrum as it shines through said planet's atmosphere. And to criminally oversimplify, the spectra created by the team could be described as hypothetical yet realistic identikits of a planet orbiting a white dwarf. Not just any planet, mind you, but one that could sustain life. The transmission spectra can be used by other researchers and astronomers to help them identify Earth-like planets in the future. To quote Professor Kardnegger again, if we find such a rocky planet in the habitable zone of a white dwarf, then scientists in the near future could use our spectra to spot signs of life on such worlds. If. As we know, white dwarfs can carve up planets as if they were roast chickens before eating them. Until 2020, astronomers had never actually observed a planet orbiting a white dwarf. 
Or we could pick up from Earth were clues which may be interpreted as the leftovers from a stellar feast, X-rays emitted by planetary shards plunging into the core of a dwarf or rocky debris floating in its atmosphere. But in September 2020, Professor Andrew Vandenberg at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and University of Texas at Austin published in the journal Nature an encouraging discovery. Here we report the observation of a giant planet candidate transiting the white dwarf WD 1856 plus 534 every 1.4 days. We Modeled the periodic dimming of the white dwarf caused by the planet Candidate passing in front of the star in its orbit. The planet Candidate is roughly the same size as Jupiter and no more than 14 times as massive. That's all well and good, but surely a Jupiter sized giant is not exactly Earth like and not a prime candidate to sustain life. But that's not the point here. Professor Vandenberg and team point out that their findings, quote, indicate that giant planets can be scattered into tight orbits without being tidally disrupted. In other words, some white dwarfs are so kind as to allow planets to orbit them without, you know, butchering them. Well, at least WD 1856 plus 534 was. This discovery is crucial as it motivates the search for smaller transiting planets around white dwarfs. This discovery was not lost on the Cornell team we mentioned earlier. In fact, also in September 2020, Professor Carlton Egger, Dr. Kazakis, and their team quoted Professor Vandenberg's research in their paper, The White Dwarf Opportunity, Robust Detections of Molecules in Earth-like Exoplanet Atmospheres with the James Webb Space Telescope. In this study, they wondered, what if an Earth-like planet were to exist in the habitable zone of the white dwarf observed by Professor Vandenberg. Would we be able to analyze such a planet from afar? So they explored the potential for JWST to study the atmosphere of this hypothetical body and thus pick up clues as to its capability to sustain life. So, did JWST deliver? Well, yeah, it seems so. To quote again, we establish that the atmospheric composition of such Earth-like planets orbiting white dwarfs can be precisely retrieved with JWST. Rocky planets in the white dwarf habitable zone therefore represent a promising opportunity to characterize terrestrial planet atmospheres and explore the possibility of a second genesis on these worlds. So in conclusion, can we state with certainty that white dwarfs can be at the center of a Goldilocks zone and thus play host to inhabitable planets? Well, potentially yes, but so do many millions of other stars which are yet to cool down and die. Statistically speaking, we can be almost certain that there is life out there. But if we cannot detect it, what difference does it make? What makes white dwarfs so special is that their characteristics make it easier to analyze potential exoplanets orbiting around them. This would increase our chances to detect the telltale signs of life in the most unlikely of places, next to a dead star. To quote from Carlton Egger's paper again, Somewhere in the vast expanse of the cosmos, life may yet flourish, illuminated by the remnant core of a long-forgotten star.